I was up in northern Norway and I had prayed for about 10 years to meet Ron because I had read in a small notice in a Swedish daily newspaper that the Ark of the Covenant was found. And so I thought if, if, if this um, Ark really has been found then it must be a man of God that found it because God wouldn't trust it to anybody else. So I said, Lord, please let me meet this man, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, then, uh, I think it was 10 years later, I came up to Northern Norway and somebody put a video in. They said, you got to see this. And they put the video in and there it was. The four presentations of Ron and his four fans and among them was the Ark of the Cavern. I thought, this is the guy that I've been praying to, in, about uh, to meet. You know, and in the end there was um, a presentation of the White Archaeological Research. So I just um, made contact and I found out that the Norwegian group was going down with Ron that very autumn. I saw this tape, I think, in, in September or October 95. And then I went uh, with this Norwegian group in the end of November to meet with Ron and to travel with him and I actually did an extra week because I really wanted to check on this man <laughs> to see who he was because people were saying well you can you can darken a, a mountain peak on a computer and uh, this guy is a fake and so I thought I want to check this up for myself and immediately when I saw these things what moved me a lot was of course the the story about uh, the Ark of the Covenant but when when I saw you presenting Mount Sinai and this is where Israel got the Ten Commandments, it moved me to tears and I just felt I want to go there. I, I knew it was a place where God had presented himself, you know, and it was, I think, it's just in my own heart, a haunt after God, I was just longing. So I began to pray to the Lord. I said, Lord, um, help me to get into Saudi Arabia. And I immediately, you know, after the trip to Israel in December, the, the following year, in January 96, I applied for a diver's, diver's license because I figured I wanted to see the, the things on the bottom of the sea myself. And I began at the same time to pray and ask the Lord to give me context because I wanted to get into Saudi Arabia. And would you believe it? That summer at that hospital up in northern Norway, I was going to do a whole year there. That summer I had a patient that came from Saudi Arabia and I was amazed. It has never ever happened to me. All the thousands and thousands of women that I worked with as midwife, no one ever came from Saudi Arabia. But that summer, a woman came from Saudi Arabia as a refugee into Iraq and then on to Norway. Uh, another thing that happened was that I met uh, a gynecologist. He just told me that I, I went to Saudi Arabia. I'd never met a gynecologist. He came up to do a locum in the hospital up there. I've never met anyone before who, who just said that he'd been to Saudi Arabia. And then three weeks, weeks after him, another one came. And I, of course, I started to interview them a lot, you know, and I said, can you please, uh, can you tell me how he got in there? And they gave me the name of a lady in Copenhagen who has an agency and has contact with the, the Saudi Arabian officials uh, and the hospitals and send hospital staff over to Saudi Arabia from Scandinavia. So I just got in contact with her and she sent me the application forms and in September she came to Stockholm and she interviewed me. And, and she told me what was required and everything and then from that time just rolled on you know because I had to do many vaccinations it took uh, like three months to prepare to go well being a woman in Saudi Arabia is tough 
um, but you know, as a Westerner, you have to uh, you have to uh, adjust to that and be willing to adjust to it. But the women, they are dressed in a black abaya. They in a certain area where I was, they even had to cover their whole face and their eyes as well and their hands. They had gloves on their hands. So it was like when you met people on the street, it was like meeting black ghosts. I mean, you could hear a voice talking behind this black material, but you couldn't read any eyes or, or read a face. We all had to adjust what I... I was suffering because of the heat, you know, because wearing a black material and then the sun on top of that, that was very, very hot being out in the streets. So in midday you would never see people. You wouldn't see the women out in the streets. They would come out maybe in the evening to do some shopping, you know, when the sun was setting. Uh, also, you were very st restricted. You were not supposed to drive a car. You were not supposed to go in a car with somebody that you were not married to. And uh, that really put boundaries around the women. They were mostly in the houses, actually, or going with their husbands to shop. But very seldom you would see them out on their own. That year they beheaded four people uh, in the, on the street outside the, mosque, the big mosque in that city. People who had been dealing with drugs or killed people or so. And it was a big event in the city, even, you know, it was announced ahead of time. And even uh, some Ar Arabian male staff went, only males went to see those things. So they, they went to see this event, you know. Well, I studied, I studied the Wyatt archaeological research, <laughs> their stories about um, how Ron was in the desert. I also read Larry Williams' book, um, the, the Mountain of Moses, and I. But it really didn't help me very much because the desert is so vast, and you can travel for days, you know. So I had to pray my way, and I said, Lord, please show me a way. And I found out that at the hospital was a diver's shop, uh, a dive club. I went in there and became a member. And uh, I was there like for a couple of months without saying, telling why I really was in Saudi Arabia. I knew one, no one really knew. But um, after a while, I found out that I just felt one day I came in there that I should tell two guys. And an elderly man from Switzerland, he was standing close by and heard my conversation. And he came up to me afterwards and said, I have been by that mountain. He had read the mountain of Moses and he had got a whole, he had gotten a permission to go to the mountain a, a military permission and a whole convoy of American uh, militaries went to see this mountain and they were, were having like a big reception by the Bedouins and Bedouin police and he showed me many pictures from that and while they were driving their way to the mountain they actually did a recording uh, like the militaries do how they drive to the mountain so he, oh, he was the guy that really opened up for me to find the mountain. Because I had been looking for it. Um, I did at least five whole long day trips just looking for the mountain. And every time I was getting closer to it. But always something used to happen. Like the last time when we were like only four kilometers from reaching the mountain, uh, a, guy's t a, a guy got the guy that then was driving, that was Robert Howard, his tires got stuck in the sand. Mm -hmm. And so there we were. And, um, and we were, um, some Bedouins came to help us. We were also invited into a Bedouin camp and they gave us um, coffee from the fire and 
They really treated us nicely. They were so lovely, these people out there in the desert. If the Bedouins, you know, most of the time they talk to the men. They address the men. They're not supposed to look at women, you know. But because they knew we didn't cover our faces and they were sort of more relaxed with us, I think. First thing I saw was the white guard house that you had had on your pictures. I recognized that one and also from your video. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I was on the right spot. That area is, is closed off by a fence, but it's like a small hill outside of that. And when you stand on that hill, we were, one day we were looking down and I just noticed that that fence was actually broken down. It was lying on the ground on some places. So I just figured it must be easy to get in there. I even could see wheels of, of trucks having driven into the holy precinct. So I thought I'm going to come back here and just do that. And so me and, a, and another guy, we just came there one day and uh, he didn't take, dare to take the risk because he didn't want to lose the jobs. He was staying outside but uh, and I just rushed in very fast. I was running and, and stumbling and falling. I think I fell four times because it's a very rocky area. Mm -hmm. It's a long way in there actually it is. Mm -hmm. But finally I saw it and I recognized some of the white pillar pieces that Ron had been talking about. I saw them and I knew I wasn't the same place, at the right place and I just stopped to take a lot of pictures. Well, um, when you are on the Bedouin road and you sort of hit the holy precinct uh, going south, then the left, the, the road that continues south, you can also take a left turn that's going east. Uh, and it's like, I measured it to be one and, well, 1600 meters from the Holy Precinct is the Golden Calf Altar. I measured that on my GPS because I did waypoints by both places and then you can measure the distance between. And it looks like huge boulders piled up. They are huge like, like is they like the same size as the boulders that are making up the pyramids in Cairo. They built piled up neatly like this and on the back side, on the front side it looks they, they're still in place but on the back side they have been come tumbling down. There, right outside the Holy Precinct and the Golden Calf Altar, there is an enormous plane. Enormous. It took, I mean, it takes a long time to just drive through it, which we have done. And there is a, a way going through the mountain ridge. There's just sort of, mountain ridge is coming like this and it's just breaking its way through mm -hmm. and coming out into another vast plain. In the ancient tradition, as I understand it, um, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai uh, is a place where God revealed Himself. And they knew that from the story of Moses. And then later on when Elijah needed to seek God, he walked from Carmel down to Mount Horeb to seek God. Also Paul went that journey. That's what Galatians 1.17.12 uh, tells us. And so, there is an, a big cave there in the mountain and um, you know the story in 1 Kings 19 and verse 11 tells us how that the prophet Elijah came there after having walked 40 days and 40 nights from Mount Carmel and he, he went into this cave and stayed over the night and then um, he, God's voice comes to him and says, um, what are you doing here, Elijah? And, and he tells why he's there. And then God says, come out and stand on the mountain before me. And if you see the picture that I have taken, there, there is a place outside the cave where, where you actually can stand. And you can see the whole mountain and the whole view there from there. So 
then the story goes on to tell how there came a storm that that broke loose pieces from the mountain and also rent rocks. The Bible actually says that the rocks rent. And when I, I had read that story, I realized this is the place where Elijah came. So I started to look for those things. But but I think I've been, I mean, I've been like by the mountain five times and I've noticed those stones without having it clicking first. You know, I saw stones lying in the holy precinct. It's a big boulder. It looks like a knife has just cut it, cut it into two pieces like this, like, just like this. I've been traveling in the desert so, for so many days, just looking for this mountain and this place. Nowhere have I seen um, boulders that have been split like that into two halves, like you cut an egg with a sharp knife and it just slime like that. Uh, so that was one thing I saw. Another thing that I saw was that there were stones there that looked like they had been scourged on the top. Um, they, they were too far from the scourged mountain top to have been come tumbling down from that one. So they must have been scourged on place at the holy precinct. So the underside of them, they, some of them have been turned because the Bedouins have been doing work there. On the, un, the underside there was no scorching. And you know the Bible says that God came also, a fire came. God was not in the storm, he was not in the fire, but the fire came when Elijah was standing there waiting for the Lord to come. I found it interesting um, when I asked Marinelle Wyatt to come to, to, to count the plane there and find out the middle of that plane. And she gave me a, a, a waypoint, which I put, plotted into my GPS and we went there by car and when we came to the very middle of it, there was a tree standing. And on that whole plain, there is no tree as far as the eyes can see. You know, but there was this tree, and it looked like even there had been water there. And I think there is a scripture saying that the tabernacle was once in the middle of the camp. But I also want to talk about Paul, you know, because in, he was thinking what they think as soon as he got saved he went and became a teacher in Antioch that's what how they think you know that he was teaching in Antioch for three years before he began his traveling ministry but he he says uh, very clearly he tells what happened when he got saved in Galatians 1 he tells that and he says he didn't go up to confer with the apostles in Jerusalem he didn't go here and there he he went to Arabia. I believe that it was a tradition among the Jews that this is a place where God revealed himself. Uh, when he found out that I had been at the mountain and that I had found the crossing site and that I had been again to uh, dive there, he asked me to film some of the bottom of the sea and he lent me I went over in September 97, I went over to Nashville and borrowed equipment, a video camera and underwater housing and I filmed and Ron said, just don't care what you see, just film the bottom of the seas, and which I did. Uh, and then he also asked me to try to find Mara, where the bitter waters were made sweet. And so I started on that one, and I started to do a search, and on ancient Arabian maps, I found the name Mara. And Mara um, was a well, and well, on uh, Arabic, there are eight different words for well in Arabic, but one of them is Ajin, Ajin. And so I found the name Ajin Mara on an ancient map and I got so far as making the waypoints 
I plotted it into my my GPS and I was going to go there but I never got to it before I, my contract was over and I was going to leave. So that was my, my mistake but somebody else went to document the rent rock again. Somebody that I showed the way and they found it and they sent the, the waypoints for that. But as far as I know no one has been to Ajimara yet and that's why I really wanted to go back because Ron asked me to do that but I never got to it. No, well I had, I was maybe a little bit fearful because I heard you know Ron was warning me he said you know you can be raped and be buried in the sand and all of that and so I was praying because but my longing for God was greater than my fear and then I went to a Sunday morning meeting in my church and I was praying and asking the Lord to speak to me because I had these fearful thoughts. Then at the church coffee afterwards a Jewish girl stands up and she says, does anybody want a prophecy here? I said, yes! <laughs> She prophesied to another guy first, then she came over to me. She prophesied my fear. She says, you, um, you don't have, she didn't know what I was going to do. And she prophesied to me that I did not have to have any fear about being raped in the desert. Because God was going to protect me and hold his hand over me. Which he did. Or he always has done. All the time when I've been traveling for the king in kingdom business. He has always, always protected me.